All right, kids. Now grab your mustaches and let's go to work. That's like one of my biggest fears is that I'm going to do one of these shows and forget to record it. Um, all right. Welcome to Hammer Factor, episode 90. We have Lewis Geltman, North Fork champion. Hmm. North Fork champion. Okay. The North Fork. Does it mean anything anymore? Championship. John Weld, co owner of Immersion Research. I'm your host here, John Grace. We have got quite the show lined up for you. We've got Charlie Wald, uh, Waldridge coming on to talk about a Walbridge. huge, Walbridge. huge, what, didn't I say Waldridge? What did I say? Walbridge, BB. Waldridge. Yes. Oh yeah, Walbridge. Sorry. Charlie Walbridge coming on to talk about a huge land acquisition in West Virginia on the Big Sandy River. I think it's like four and a half miles or something, my best understanding. He is also the Accident Database Safety Database Manager for American Whitewater, so we'll probably get into some stories with him. Do you guys ever do you ever find that you're like going to the river to go do something scary, and like there's like a voice in your head that's like reading out what Charlie Walbridge would write about your demise on that particular yeah. day on the river? No, but I've read <laughs> so many of his accident reports. <laughs> I've never known paddling without reading his accident reports. I was trying yeah, to think. I mean, I'll be like going to the river and be like, like Lewis Geltman was a well-known local kayaker was paddling the little white salmon <laughs> at higher than recommended levels when he encountered a, <laughs> a new piece of wood. I mean, like I, like I, I, I can't like do it right, but I'm like, like driving to the river, just like thinking about like my, my voice in my head is the Charlie Walbridge accident report of my day. Lewis Geltman often described as <laughs> cocky and half baked. <laughs> uh, they should put me in charge of that. Uh, yeah, you want that? You want to take that? Take the torch from Charlie? No, God, no. But he Man. can't do it for like who? I mean, he, I think he gets a lot of grief for that. You know, people are always sort of second guessing him on it and stuff like that. But it's an important job, right? It's super important. I feel like he always writes it very neutral too. Like, it's like an aviation accident write up. Yeah, you know what I'm saying it's yeah. very like yeah. like the NTSB or some organization like that. <clears throat> I mean, you guys. I mean, this is this is totally anecdotal, but I feel like we're that the number of deaths per thousand kayakers is increasing every year slowly well on the american whitewater website there is a graph and deaths are increasing is that now, i don't i don't know if that's in relation to participation or you know exactly. like is it because there's more people paddling class five or is there more people in the sport or are is boat technology allowing people to run harder whitewater before they're really don't they don't have the skills to 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 it's like it feels like on one way it was like you know boats everything got like boats got way safer and then the deaths went down like you know it used to be that like every year you'd read about like bow pin drownings and like you don't really get that anymore there, but then a, and it were like squirt boating was supposed to be safer do you remember that <clears throat> i mean it's a minority of people but that i was think the, i do remember something about that yeah yeah that's wild i mean that was <laughs> I put that in the same like flat earth or type <laughs> nonsense. I mean, it's probably safer if you're just going and hanging out on like a class one eddy line. Absolutely. But running up a golly, no. No. Charlie also has a rapid named after him, by the way. I I'm sure a lot of people know this, but some people may not. There's a rapid in the yacht named after Charlie. Charlie's choice. Wasn't Charlie's choice to walk out or something? I believe it was. <laughs> Maybe we could get to the bottom of that. Or I think Carrie the rapper. <laughs> he has paddled, by the way, he has paddled the exact same. I, I assume he still paddles the same boat. I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but he has paddled the exact same boat since the 60s. And I no, made 70s. The Han. I, yeah, I made two of these. When I worked at Valley Mill. The Han. The Han C1. I mean, it's 13 feet, two inches. You know, it's old school. 
he's a big dude, right? I mean, the guy's like six, four, something like that. A couple hundred, you know, two thirty, two forty. 240. He, he's not a small dude. And this Han is enormous. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's like an open canoe with a deck on it. That's awesome. I can't wait to hear about the Han. I've never even heard of the Han. So yeah, H H A H N, right? Han. Yeah. yeah. Apologies like if you're listening though. to this. <laughs> listen to the show. I have a uh, we have a new pup in our family. There it is. So <laughs> hopefully it doesn't cause me. Alfred. To... Alfred, yeah, Alfred the dog. Like named after Batman's butler. <laughs> yeah, he kind of looks like Batman's butler, to be honest. <clears throat> anyway. He's uh my family's gone and I'm on dog sitting duty while I'm recording the hammer factor. So hmm. bear with me. I expect my dog will chime in at some point. Lewis, do you have any uh policy updates on the front of outdoor recreational policy? Yeah, I don't know where to start, man. Um I was out on sabbatical from mid December until about a week ago. So I'm just, just kind of catching back up again. Uh, I love it. I was sabbatical. It was lovely. I'm Thanks sure for asking. Did you <laughs> do a chance to regroup like uh. mentally? And... Yeah, it, it lasted like 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 24 hours after <laughs> I returned to work. I thought like sabbatical like, is supposed to be like months long or a year or something like that. Where I, mean, you, like, think it, you I think in academia like, it is. But... Jerusalem for, you know, to like study texts of some sort. Yeah, I think that's like academia. I think that the nonprofit sabbatical is a little, a little mellower. But I went down to the FUDA. That was good. Um, yeah, I think a couple weeks down there. Very restorative. I recommend it. Oh, I bet that was badass. Where'd you stay? What'd you do? Um, dude, we just did kind of like pretty like lightning strike food a trip, honestly. Like flew into Tamuco, got boats in Pucon from Ian, ran the Fui on the way south, spent like two weeks at the food and went back north. Um but we stayed um we stayed at Fidel Moreno's place, which is like I don't know, like on River Left, a little upstream of Terminator. Just like super cool little like treehouse place he built back there, like no running water or electricity or anything, but very pleasant. Me and Darby and um, Nick Lima and Kira um, had a real nice time down there. I don't know the, the food is just like it's just such a nice place, man. It's just like clean water and big hot stressful white water, just launching off big green waves all day. It's like it's it's hard to beat i think what you do when you aren't paddling read my book lay around oh, that sounds so nice <laughs> there's a big crew of montana boys down there we played a bunch of poker with that was good <laughs> i got, got back in the game a poker player once <laughs> uh, part of your history yeah anyway, anyway so that's good so anyway back to work i don't know everything's good just like kind of kind of trying to make some plans for the year i mean i feel like i don't know like you guess you wrote in the show notes great it's just like what's in store for the election year and like you know like i feel like when the new congress starts it's like you know everybody's introducing a million pieces of legislation and the administration has a ton of ambition and you don't exactly know which of these things are gonna like make a ton of progress or like get momentum and at this point like you know second year of the congress like year before the presidential election it's like we're down to like a much smaller list of things and we kind of have a pretty good idea of what's um what's realistic if not necessarily like 100 percent what's going to happen so i mean like congress wise we had that um this package of recreation policy stuff. Um, it's been on the Senate side, it's been called America's Outdoor Recreation Act or AORA. And the House has like an analog to that now called the Explore Act that just passed out of committee while I was out um, back in January. That's yeah, that's right. So just <laughs> trying to get that, get that to the House floor at some point here in the not too distant future. And, um, I don't know, hopefully get that thing done this year. I think things are going to get pretty 
I don't know. It's not like Congress is pretty dysfunctional right now. And I think, you know, the closer it gets to the election, the less there's going to be any appetite to like do anything. So I think things will kind of peter out in Congress by like June and then hopefully, you know, some opportunity to do some stuff after the election. But that totally depends on what happens in the election. You say this remarkable uh, streak of progress is going to come to a screeching halt here soon? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, you I know, like all this momentum. That I don't know, dude. I mean, we can we can close on this package for sure. It's stuff that we've worked on for like 10 years and like it it feels like legitimate opportunity. Um, you know, maybe some protective designations, maybe Congress will pass a farm bill, maybe not, but that potentially has a bunch of conservation money in it and some like forest policy. And then, you know, in terms of like administrative actions, there are a bunch of things going right now that, um, you know, Biden administration is trying to like close out on this first term. Like there's this uh, BLM public lands rule that we're like expecting to see a final rule like in the next couple of months that will really improve conservation management on BLM land managed for multiple use. Um, they just, um, we just filed comments on this. Uh, it's not a rulemaking, but it's like a rulemaking to protect old growth on national forests across the country. It's like basically a forest plan amendment for every national forest to protect old growth forests, like pretty big deal. Um, yeah, I mean, just like a bunch of things like that, like oil and gas leasing regs are getting updated in a way that'll be super beneficial for, you know, directly protecting recreation sites that could potentially be affected by oil and gas development. Just like a bunch of like pretty good stuff going on. And then one pretty fucked up thing going on in the administration right now is just around climbing management um the way the land management agencies manage fixed anchors for climbing so like basically bolting in wilderness that's turned into kind of a uh kind of a mess right now and we're trying to get the administration to kind of walk back on some of this stuff to make sure that you know you can still climb in the wilderness basically um but we'll be working on that a bunch so is this one of those like to. letter of the law thing if it's designated a wilderness area kind of yeah it's it's kind of it's like super technical but like basically the wilderness act prohibits installations and for 60 years what that's meant has been like you know like it's has been like bridges or like significant structures and under pressure from some pretty extreme wilderness groups, the land management agencies feel like they have to adopt this interpretation of the Wilderness Act that would say that a bolt is an installation within the meaning of the Wilderness Act, which means that they're prohibited in wilderness unless they go through this minimum requirements analysis process, which is this like super onerous administrative process to say that this bolt is necessary for facilitating the purposes of the Wilderness Act, which includes primitive and unconfined recreation is the term. So it can work maybe, but it would be super suboptimal and would create this like huge thicket of red tape to basically like replace bolts in wilderness on climbs that, you know, predate the Wilderness Act and there's nothing in the the history of the Wilderness Act that evinces any intent to prohibit this fundamental tool for climbing, basically. So I think it's it's kind of this push and pull between, you know, one reading of the language of the Wilderness Act versus 60 plus years of history. And I think the land management agencies are feeling like they're getting put in a tough spot on this where they feel like they have a lot of pressure to adopt this interpretation of the Wilderness Act is like what they're getting from their attorneys. But um, if they do this, it's going to create a huge amount of problems for climbers. And, you know, if climbers end up in a position where they're no longer able to support new wilderness designations, it's really going to pull apart, you know, the con a constituency that's, you know, 
been pretty effective in bringing home new wilderness designations. You know, like if the the climbers aren't able to support wilderness, the mountain bikers can't support wilderness. Like we're not going to be really supporting wilderness designations anymore. The outdoor industry is not going to be supporting wilderness designations anymore. And then like, where are we? So it would, it would be, it'd be super shitty for climbers. And I think it would be a big step back for conservation generally, if they, they have to go this route, you know, like, I think there are these, you know, one in particular, pretty extreme wilderness advocacy group that just, you know, wants bolts out, wants climbers out, don't like seeing people having too much fun in wilderness, but I think they're taking a, a pretty myopic view of, of conservation really. So what organization is that? Uh, it's a, it's called wilderness watch. And so these lawyers, are they getting pressure from somebody to read this this down to the letter of the law like that, restricting replacing bolts? Is, is somebody complaining about it or is this just coming internally? This is something I, I don't totally understand. Like I have a hard time, like, you know, in any other environment other than the federal government, like lawyers work for you, like the principals. And like you and you know the lawyers aren't going to like let you do something flatly illegal but when like the law is can be interpreted in multiple ways and you tell them the position you want to take it's their job to you know rationalize that more or less or like present your argument and it seems to me like um that's not what's happening here because i don't believe that anyone in the land management agencies really wants to stick it to climbers like those guys all are like cool with climbing and like they understand the problems with like pulling apart the the um pulling apart the team on wilderness advocacy basically but they sort of feel bound by this interpretation from lawyers and i you know the lawyers are certainly hearing it from like wilderness watch and others but that dynamic is a little difficult for me to understand. Fight the good fight, Lewis. I'm trying. Recreation, not red tape. Just go in there and be like, look, we just <laughs> want to go have some fun. When, yeah. you were, when you were out, did you have an autoresponder that said you were on sabbatical? I did. So it says sabbatical. That's right. That's a power move. Yeah, you like that? I do like that. <laughs> I think I also put on my autoresponder that I'm not going to read all my emails when I get back. So if your email is important, please email me again later. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's some, that's some clout, dude. Seriously. <laughs> you ever know this is what you're doing? Are you like, are you like, like making your own little empire there? <laughs> just... We got to get Kramer on. Oh yeah, man, we're gonna get Kramer right here just to kind of—he can be like the uh, unofficial insider. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. Pull that off. Grace, Kramer, there, Kramer's my boss, and a, and a <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's avid great yeah. false kayaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, Grace, you and I, and actually Geltman too, we we talk a lot before the show about different things we'd love to talk about. You know, there's a few things going on that I would, I'm just chomping at the bit to, to discuss. Like, how can we dip, dip our toes into this, into these subjects? I don't know. It's, it's, it's probably going to have to be like an ABRG thing or something because I don't know. It, it's, it's salacious. It's juicy too. You know what I mean? It's it is. Well, and, and I think, I mean, I think it's relevant too, right? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. What are we, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I, I don't know how to approach it. I need someone with a a greater journalistic acumen to come up with a way to do this. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, the problem is that people just tell us stuff in our as our friends that is yeah. not necessarily suitable for repeating on the podcast. You know, all the time. <laughs> yeah, all <laughs> yeah. the time. Like yeah. always I, mean, I don't want to burn those bridges and get cut out yeah. of the gossip loop you know and at the same time it seems like you can do anything you want in this industry and everyone's gonna be afraid to call you out <laughs> john <laughs> drunk on his own power <laughs> oh, God. 
<laughs> yeah, you're the biggest gossip in the whitewater industry, I reckon. Who? Oh, me or Grace? You. Not, not me. <laughs> Grace is right there with me. No, I'm not. I'll go on streaks, <laughs> but you're like year in and year out, man. <laughs> yeah. I have a guy, I have a guy who works at a boat company. A guy. Yeah. I got some I, guys too. Yeah. His initials are CK. Uh he's like my favorite. <laughs> Is that your dog, Liz? That's my Pay dog. Down there. What's Toppy. your dog's name? Say hi. Toppy. Toppy. Mm. Yeah, he wants to go to the dog park. Is Toppy bite? Um hasn't yet. Um, well, we got rants and raves. I got how did I lose my intro? I had it all figured Sorry, out. Sorry, I got I took us down a the, rabbit hole about Charlie Walbridge and my fantasies of my own death. I lost it back <laughs> at the sabbatical. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I did too. Yeah. <clears throat> um, anyway, Charlie Walbridge, he is currently we're going to have him on here in one minute. I'm going to read a little intro on Charlie that was on the American Whitewater site. It's a little long, but I think it's worthy. Charlie Walbridge started canoeing at summer camp in the early 60s and started paddling whitewater seriously in college. He was an active C1 slalom and wildwater racer and he worked as part <clears throat> worked part time as a river guide in the 70s. He's paddled rivers throughout the US and Canada including several first ascents, but now spends most of his time in West Virginia. He ran a mail order company, Wildwater Designs, for 22 years. There, he developed the high float vests and adapted the throw line rescue bag for whitewater use. He's been the safety chair for both the American Canoe Association and AW and is well known for his articles in American Whitewater reporting on U.S. whitewater fatalities. He helped develop the ACA programs in both canoeing and swift water rescue and continues to serve as an instructor trainer. He's written many magazine articles and produced or contributed to numerous books, including the Boat Builder's Manual, Wild Water West Virginia, Appalachian Wild Water Volumes 1 and 2, the Whitewater Rescue Manual, Knots for Paddlers, and several editions of the River Safety Report. He's on the board of Friends of the Cheat River, um, which we're going to be talking about here in a little bit or at least the tributary, a watershed group um, where he fur and Camp Mog Mog Mogulus. How do you say that? Mogulus? Mogulus? Camp yeah. Mogulus, where he first learned to paddle. He currently works in an independent sales rep and does con consultations on canoeing safety for outfitters, organizations, and attorneys. Charlie lives with his wife, Sandy, in Bruce Town Mills, West Virginia, is active on the Cheat and Upper Yacht River issues. Bruce Bruce Mills. His website is, uh, yeah, Bruce Town Mills. His website is charliewalbridge.com. Like I say, I have never known paddling without his accident reports. I got I got my copy of the Boat Builder's Manual on my bookshelf right here. Do you really? <laughs> Raise your hand if you put together a Walbridge kit skirt. I remember seeing ads for him in the AW Journal that I did not do on myself. Wait, wait, yeah. wait. I mean, there was a time when if you wanted a neoprene spray skirt, Pretty much the only way to do it was to get one of these kits and Charlie would send you some neoprene and some glue and you'd glue these things together yourself. Really? Yep. And could you make it custom to the size of your cockpit? Yeah, exactly. It came with like an instruction sheet. It's like one of those like green pepper patterns you get in the mail to make like a sweater, <laughs> except for a spray skirt. <laughs> Hey Charlie, uh, that's awesome. I'm talking about my my neoprene kit skirt I got from you when I was probably about 12 years old. My goodness, that was a long time ago. That was uh, <laughs> that was probably about oh, 60 years ago. <laughs> so I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie Walbridge, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for coming on here. So we were just talking. I did a brief introduction there before we put you on. None of us have known Whitewater. I've never known a Whitewater without your accident reports. So before we get into the cheat, I got to ask, how did you get into that? How did that role fall on your lap? Well, I think it started because I was a summer camp counselor in New Hampshire, leading kids of the White Mountains. And the Appalachian Mountain Club had a... Uh, had a section in their Appalachian Journal about accidents. And I read these things and was really fascinated by them and trying to learn from them. Because, of course, this was like the 
early 60s to early 70s when, uh, you know, there just, you know, there just wasn't a lot of training that went on, except, of course, what I what I learned, what I learned at camp. And then I got into Whitewater and it was uh, it was the fall of 1975. And we were up at the uh, at the Icebreaker Slalom in Unadilla, New York, which was just just a little bit, just a little bit north of the New, New, of the New York Pennsylvania border, a little class two stream underneath the uh, Corps of Engineers Dam, and you know you sort of worked your way through the riffles, and then there was like uh, maybe a two foot ledge at the end that had a nice little wave there where they strung some tight gates, and it wasn't a hard race; it was a sort of a reunion race for all of us who were on the race circuit, and a guy got killed there. I was on the course and I looked downstream and it was obvious something was very wrong. You can just tell by the way people move on shore when something is wrong. It's all herky jerky and and you can just you can just tell how how upset people are. So I pulled over and ran down and there's this guy stuck underwater. And I didn't know what the hell was going on. I don't think any of it, any of us did. And there were some guys there who were yacht guys who were the best rescue people I knew at the time and they didn't know what to do you know a couple of the guys one guy jumped in and tried to grab the guy as he went past but that didn't work and finally they turned the water off and were able to get him out but it was too late what a and I was really upset by this and I talked to OK Goodwin who at that time was the AW safety chair and he just said well this is a freak accident well, I started talking to people and found out that he had been, he and his partner had been paddling C2. They flipped in the easy water above the ledge. His partner swam to shore, but he was sort of trying to drag his canoe to shore. And he was standing up in the, in the bottom of the river and trying to, uh, trying to walk the canoe to shore. And that was fine as long as he was in the gravelly, riffly part. But he went over the ledge and his foot caught under a rock at the bottom of the ledge. And he caught. And I talked to a lot of people, wrote it up, and the accident report went into a couple of uh, of canoe club journals, and I got these letters back, sort of like, hey, we had something very similar on the Nantahala. Hey, we had something like that on the Obed. And by the time it got in the AW, AW journal, you know, I was describing it as a foot entrapment. And, you know, they used to say, don't stand up in the river, you might sprain your ankle. Well, this showed just how much more serious it was. And that's where we got the, uh, as a, that's the origin of the strong warning that we give. And because I wrote that accident report, two years later, when Bob Taylor, who was the best kayaker in, in West Virginia at the time, Bob... Uh, died on the golly and his friends called me up and I wrote a report about that and it just kind of snowballed are you do you have a aviation background or a pilot or anything no <clears throat> have you ever read any of like the NTSB or FAA like safety like accident reports I've I've seen a couple I've seen a couple of them you know it's it's way more technical than what I do because of course flying is pretty technical but it's still the same like manner of just matter of fact uh, which well that's uh, you know that's what that's what i try to do i'm not interested in in beating on anybody i'm just interested in trying to figure out what happened and i was interested in this case because i never expected somebody who was who was well equipped and running a class two slalom was going to get killed and i wanted to protect myself and I've always, <clears throat> I've always liked to write, and I've always been a talker, and so that's where that's why I wrote a report and sent it in. So there's a drowning. How often do you have to reach out to the people, and how often do they reach out to you? Is it most of the stuff I them? get nowadays is newspaper articles about drownings of people from outside the paddling community, and mm -hmm. I think it's important to to know what's going on because you know aw is a national organization 
And I'm interested in, in the whole picture. And sometimes people contact, when someone in the paddling community is killed, sometimes people contact me and sometimes I have to reach out, reach out to them. And it's gotten much better thanks to the internet because when I started, people were either calling me up on the phone or they were, uh, or they were writing me letters. And needless to say, that didn't go very quickly. Mm-hmm. But but once email came on, people were I was getting a lot more material. And what I would often do is I would hear a rumor about something. So I'd contact someone who I knew who might who was in the area and might know, like uh, you know, I've uh, you know, there've been a couple of uh, couple of accidents in the uh, you know in the in the Hood River area recently and i've and i asked uh, your wife cara to to, right. to uh, give me some leads and right. and you know sometimes sometimes people don't want to talk to you and you end up trying to pull something together from uh from secondhand reports sometimes you get really good reports and uh, but i'm just trying to learn as much as i can and to give people an overall picture of what's of what's going on out there in the same way that when I started paddling in the 70s we'd we'd sit around the campfire and we'd trade stories about things that happened to people we knew on the river so this we could talk for I I have a thousand questions for you but two questions regarding this particular aspect of your career the first one would be is there what a tremendous amount of knowledge here in this collection of reports over the past 40 or plus years what what are the things that is there is there a few few things that that are are, are commonality between all these accidents so is there some threads or just some big flags we should be looking out for and the second thing would be is do you do you see that the rate like per thousand kayakers of fatalities is increasing as either more people are paddling class five or boating equipment is getting, allowing people less skill set to paddle harder white water, or is, is there any evidence that you see of that happening? Well, let me answer the second one and you may have to re- repeat the first one for me. Um, the, it's hard to know what the accident rate is because yeah. we don't really know how many people are out there and how many user days are out there. And yeah. also my reports are not hundred percent complete. I'm not the government and I can't force people to, to send reports in. Although in the state of Idaho, I was helping, helping out the boating law administrator there on, on a program he was running. And he told me that there were certain sheriffs in different counties who refused to send in accident reports because it was none of the state's business. So it's challenging to get all the reports and it's challenging to, uh, is even more challenging to figure out how many people are, are out there. Now about, uh, gosh, it's almost 20 years ago, AW sponsored someone who, who took a, the number of people on managed rivers where the numbers were counted pretty well Mm-hmm. And compared it to the fatality to the fatality rate on those rivers, and we found it was sort of comparable to skiing and rock climbing, but considerably safer than biking. Biking is really dangerous. You, you mean like road biking or tra- or mountain biking? Or it was biking in general, but I think a lot of it was road biking. And these were numbers that were given to us by, you know, the you know biking groups. We weren't studying the number of accidents in biking. But certainly I know a lot of people in the Morgantown area who went from road biking to mountain biking because it was just too damn scary. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I won't even get on a motorcycle. If I'm going to make a mistake, I want a shell around me to give me a little bit, little bit of protection. So that, you know, the answer to your question is we don't know. I don't think there's a huge, there's a huge difference. A lot more people, a lot more incidents. The sport is much more popular. And certainly since COVID started, um, there's been a huge influx of new people. Mostly they're wreck boaters. But 
what's happening is these these folks are getting out for a nice day on the river and they're blundering into places that have current and they do they get caught in strainers they go over low head dams or they flip and they don't have a life jacket on and they just tip over and don't resurface it's called sudden disappearance syndrome by people in the in the boating safety world and uh it's why we wear life jackets. People get disoriented and probably swim the wrong way. Hmm. But you had questions, and I can't remember the first. Well, this is a good segue. So if, if just talking about whitewater boating, what what are the common ways people die paddling whitewater? Is there a lesson we can learn here? Like, don't do these three things. Don't and, paddle. <laughs> and, I, and I think we should separate just like your enthusiast, your paddling enthusiast versus your like just wreck guy who rents something. We're talking about like the enthusiasts, right, John? Right. Well, when you're yeah, talking yeah. when you're talking about casual boaters, it's uh, it the things that the things that are most common is not wearing a life jacket, um, you you know, using alcohol or drugs, which really mess with your both your coordination and your uh, your judgment, and not knowing what they're getting into, especially not appreciating extremes of weather and water high water cold water and open water bad weather with experienced people it's you know i say the biggest dangers are are uh, is flush drowning because even if you're wearing a life jacket you go long enough through a bad enough rapid especially if you're if you're older and not in good shape it, the life jacket won't be enough to make sure, to make sure you get air Recirculating, recirculating in uh, in holes, um, strainers, and sieves. Mm. Pins there. Yeah, that seems to seems to jive. Um, How many accident reports do you think you've done, Charlie? Total. Well, there are twenty two hundred accident reports in the American Whitewater Accident Database, and I've messed with all of them. Now, some of them are just copies of newspaper articles. Some of them are uh, reports that somebody has written and which are very, very complete. I don't do much with them except cut and paste. And, and then, there are, then there are some that I've written up. You know, I'm, I'm a reporter and a collector. In your uh, swift water rescue classes, do you have a chapter on uh, Grab That Bitch? <laughs> have you ever heard this have you ever heard this term charlie no uh, okay Classic. that's the, it's the rescue technique where you really go the, the the main thing you do is try and jump in the water and grab the person who's stuck um and yeah that happens you can use a rescue jacket for that you know you you just got you, you just got to be careful because the thing that's gotten that person in trouble may get you in trouble, not so much with experienced people, but with inexperienced people, you often see res the uh, person who goes in for a rescue being the one who ends up dead. And there are, you know, there are a lot of stories of people dump jumping in to rescue their dogs because they're walking along a river and the dog's fine, but the people get in really serious trouble. Hmm. That yeah, we had... Um... Last episode, we had uh, the uh, the guy who had a very near drowning at, on the green at Go Left, and he came. Oh yeah, I heard I, I heard that one. Yeah, and the guy was on the bank, jumped in, and, and sort of pulled him out. You know, that's a very well, that, well. When you're talking about a guy jumping in there, here is somebody who is paddling the river and it just has full gear. Hmm. You know, was a very experienced boater, and and obviously had some rescue training. Right. That's a very different scenario between you know you know somebody just jumping in after their buddy. I mean that guy did a really good job, but I mean they he you know he not only had to get him loose, they had to resuscitate him afterwards. Yeah. What do you think yeah. the biggest safety innovation in kayak design has been throughout your career paddling? Large cockpits and bulkhead foot braces. Mm -hmm. The uh, you know the kayaks in the seventies with the smaller cockpit and the in uh, the pedal style foot braces. I mean, there you could get stuck in those boats in all kinds of ways. Right. 
<laughs> what about yeah. rocker? Rocker? Yeah. Did you do you, you notice mean, like a ton less vertical pins when you know modern rocker? I think came along? I think the main thing the main thing that makes for less vertical pins is shorter boats. Because we were, you know, when I started and we were paddling four meter boats, which is 13 feet, two inches. And, you know, they're paddling, you know, nine feet is considered long. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that it makes it a lot harder to pin. I, I definitely notice just from my reading that higher rocker helps paddlers in a lot of different ways. Um May, you know, being less likely to pin in steep drops, that's part of it. wonder if we're going to see, like, <clears throat> you know, the uh, the rescue vests, more like uh, big wave surfers are using, where you can kind of deploy some extra buoyancy. Like, I always sort of feel like that would help with flush drowning in particular. Like, if you just had the option, you know, hopefully this is a feature on your life jacket that you're never going to use. But if you could just, like rip the cord and like double or triple the flotation in your life jacket in that real. It's, it's been talked it's, about. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to see it available. I would too. Have you ever seen a prototype of that? Have you guys ever seen anybody try that? I remember I've, Phil Kurt working on it. I've asked. heard of some, some people <clears throat> trying it and maybe seen some things at one, at one time or another, but I haven't seen anything that was really serious. And I think it's like a lot of things, you know, you're, you know, the average paddler's chance of, uh, of, of getting flushed drowned is really, really low. And something like this, you'd easily be adding a hundred bucks to the cost of a life jacket, maybe more. That's right. So and the, closest, the closest time I ever came uh, to drowning, uh, one of the closest times was at Great Falls where I was getting resorked. And the only way I was going to come out of that thing is why I was able to get down a little bit deeper into the water and hit some current coming underneath it as well. Yeah. I mean, you would really have to know, make a good decision about when to deploy that thing. And it would be a, a liability as much as a, as a help in most scenarios, probably. Well, but in the right in the, scenario, it could totally save your life. Back in the sixties, you saw most, pa most experienced paddlers not wearing life jackets. Part of which, <laughs> part of the thing was, there weren't any really good ones. Type three jackets didn't appear until 1977, but the the other the other part was that uh, they were they wanted to have the freedom to swim and and to deal with and to deal with currents. There's a guy named Dan Sullivan who, you know, gosh, for you know, when I lived in D.C. and for decades afterwards, he would be paddling on the Potomac with no life jacket. He kept getting hassled by the Park Service until finally the superintendent wrote the Dan Sullivan rule that anyone who had been paddling for for fifty for for thirty or forty years didn't have to wear a life jacket. I'm in. <laughs> you, you've crossed the threshold. <laughs> Thank God. Right here. Right, let's, let's talk about the Big Sandy. That's that's what we're here for. And uh, what. So the Big Sandy, uh, people on the East Coast, of course, or most people in the U.S. are probably know this river, but certainly in the East Coast, it's a fabulous class four to class five section of white water that goes down along uh, uh, in the West Virginia, flows into the Cheat of the Takeout, right? Yeah, and it goes. It goes to the. Uh, it put it put in at a at a bridge at a place called Rockville. It's an old logging town, and goes down to Jenkinsburg. Which is another old logging town, which is the confluence with the Cheat. Right. And it's and my favorite river. For sure. You live right there. You live on the Big Sandy, very close to it, right? Live we live on the hill. I wouldn't want to live next to the Big Sandy. The winters, the winter, you know, the winters down in there get cold and damp and icy. People live on the hills around there for a reason. <laughs> so to set the stage a little bit, I mean, this is Classic West Virginia. It's kind of steep, somewhat inaccessible river. Uh, you know, it's wooded. Um, the shuttle takes uh, a little bit longer to expect because you have to sort of drive up over this mountain and back down to Rockville when you run the shuttle. Um, river right side seems to have its share of four-wheel traffic, certainly down to 
down to uh, Wonder Falls, which is kind of the first noteworthy rapid in that section. The river left always struck me as kind of just wooded far farmland or farmland up at the top of the hill down it's to the It's not back. farmland. It's it's woods. Yeah. Um, who owned the property and how did this all come to pass? And what was the, like, what was the drive behind it? Like, what's the, what's the well, big the picture? Well, the history is kind of interesting. Um, it was, uh, it was originally owned, owned, owned by a power company. The power company was going to dam the Cheat River, putting in a dam down at the Beaver Hole, which is a couple of miles below Jenkinsburg. It was mm -hmm. going to flood a good portion of the Cheat and also go a good distance up the Big Sandy. There was also a proposal to put a dam in just above just above Rockville, which would have which would have flooded most of the whitewater section of uh, of the Upper Big Sandy, but but uh, the uh, Cheat Canyon Dam didn't get built because the Cheat Canyon is full of caves, and once they did that, they realized it would never hold water. You build the dam, and the water would just go into the caves and come out God knows where. Oh. And, and uh, with the Big Sandy, they were pretty far along on planning that 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 Rockville Dam. They were, you know, they they were taking samples and doing some ground clearing, and this was right before World War II. Hmm. And the you know World War II killed that project, thank goodness. So you have this this land in the Cheat Canyon and the Big Sandy, which was owned by and various power companies. By the time I moved there, it was Allegheny Energy. Allegheny Energy sold it to Allegheny Wood Products, which was a logging company. Mm -hmm. And there was there was an effort in two thousand to uh, to purchase a, to purchase a cheap canyon. The state bid. They fell. They failed by about two hundred thousand dollars, which makes me wonder. If AWP didn't have a mole in the forestry department, <laughs> but we'll never we'll never know the answer to that. And AWP did some blogging in both in both the Cheat and Big Sandy, but it was interesting. There was a fellow named John Robard who was doing a doctorate at WVU, and he volunteered with friends of Cheat, and we ran the Cheat with him. And he said they're never going to log this place, and I said, Jesus, John, why not? And he said, well, it's too steep. And what they're going to find is it's just too expensive to go in there. And you can't find people to work on those slopes anymore. And they're just they're just going to find there's more trouble than it's worth. And actually, it was, you know, a lot of the reason that this was bought was that the owner of the company is very conservative, very anti-public land. And... Uh, it was, you know, he did the same thing on the Blackwater, just his way of showing of showing who was in charge. Well, the company hit some serious problems back in back in the uh, in the '08 dot com bubble when it burst. Not the dot com bubble. I'm sorry, the uh, housing bubble burst, and they ended up selling this all of their land to a, to the Forest Land Group, which is a holding company in North Carolina. And on one of my southern trips, I just dropped by and talked to them. Was and it a AWP sold the land? AWP okay. sold their property to the Forest Land Group. And the Forest Land Group ended up selling 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 the Sheet Canyon to the state. And uh, it was a it was a guy who worked for the department of DEP, Dave Brown, who was particularly instrumental in making it happen. But and that's both, both sides of the uh, both sides of the cheat for the entire length of the canyon. Yes, right. But AWP never sold off the Big Sandy property, and I had talked to some of their people, and they were very keen to sell it to a developer, and eventually they did. They sold it. They sold it to uh, to the, the waterfront development, and the, the Upper Big Sandy. The river right side has been pretty much subdivided into lots. The river left side is going to go on next, and they are planning also to do the uh, the lower Big Sandy between um, Rockville Bridge and uh, and Wonder Falls. They're going to create a little 
private park, River Right at Wonder. But then there was this River Left parcel. Now, we, Dave Huff, I, I started working with Dave Huff, who's a retired outfitter who has property in the area. And Dave made contact with uh, with some of the, with with uh, with with uh, with a key person at the Waterfront Development Company. We brought the conservation fund in to take a look at it, and the conservation fund made an offer for both the river left and the river right side, and it wasn't enough. It wasn't nearly enough, and a country, you know, when when a uh, land trust or a conservation organization buys property, they can't pay more than the assessed value. And the they never reached an agreement as to what the value was. And I suspect the hang up was the section on River Right between Jenkinsburg Bridge and Wonder Falls, because that piece was very developable. And they were there was about a million dollars difference between what they wanted and what conservation fund could uh, could pay. How many acres are we talking about in this in this deal? The total the total acreage on both sides would be about three hundred. Three hundred acres. And what was what was the amount of money that they were that they offered, or what kind of money were they looking for? I I can't give you the the numbers right offhand, but I'm saying that there was a significant difference, and it's a problem that the land trusts have had before because. Because, like when when uh, when when uh, you know the the consortium of landowners who own Woods Ferry was trying to sell that land to the Park Service, the Park Service wanted to value it as you know remote woodland in in West Virginia when and the uh, people that uh, you know. You know, you know, Emra and Dave Arnold and those guys. What they wanted was a beautiful piece of land on our on a unique gorge and the main midpoint access. And they mm -hmm. fought. They fought with uh, with the Park Service for years, and in fact threatened to close it off one year. But that's that's another story. And AW did some stuff then to keep to keep it open. But it's. It's a limitation as to what they can do. Now, I had I had worked with uh, with with uh, the West Virginia Land Trust because because uh, I got some money together to buy the uh, Jenkinsburg access. Uh, Dave Huff owned it, and Dave and I talked, and you know, it's like we really need to find the long-term solution for this because neither of us are getting any younger. And it was quite an education as to how these guys worked. I mean, they just don't take the land. You know, they it has to go through their land committee and then, they, then it's studied and then they take it. Mm -hmm. And the process takes, oh, probably a year if everything goes well. Right. And... We did, you know, we were able to do that with with Jenkinsburg, but uh, this piece of this piece of land on river on river left, um, well, I need to go back a bit because when the conservation fund was getting involved, they said, Charlie, will you will you raise some money just to show you know to show us that there is local support, and I started calling people and asking for major gifts. And I was much more successful than I thought I was going to be. And we had significant money uh, raised. And so when the conservation funds offer was rejected, Dave and I looked at each other and said, we should make our own offer. And because of the generosity of about 24 people, and most of them are older paddlers who... Uh, you know, they're, you know, their kids are out of school. They got enough. They got more than enough money to live on. So, you know, people gave five, ten thousand dollars. A couple of people gave twenty. You know, it was, uh, it was, it was a pretty, it was pretty impressive. So we were able to go 
to the uh, waterfront development company and make an offer, which was accepted. Now, the next thing we had to do was to figure out how we were going to get get the uh, get the land protected, because you know the waterfront development company is not going to sit around for a, for a year waiting to see if the uh, if the if the West Virginia Land Trust is going to accept it. We had the land trust on board. They walked the river with us. We were pretty sure it was going to happen, but it wasn't going to happen fast. And so what we needed to what we needed to do was to have an intermediary hold the land. And you know, worst came to worst, you know, maybe Dave or I would have held it, but American Whitewater was willing to hold the property. And so I called in the pledges. People sent the money to American Whitewater. We got like about 95% of the ple- of the money pledged. And then AW bought the property and they will hold it while West Virginia Land Trust does their due diligence and then they will pass it on to them. AW doesn't want a whole big piece of the property because it's hard for a small national organization to keep track of that sort of thing. Um, and in, in both the Land Trust and AW are depending heavily on Friends of Cheap to be their boots on the ground. And so that so that's that's where it sta- where it stands right now. So what four is, and a half miles of Riverbank on the river left. Is how far does that does that make it all the way from Rockville to Jenkinsburg, or it's got to be pretty close, right? Makes it to uh, state owned property um, down at the uh, down down at the Blue Hole. Okay. And, now, Charlie, this uh, this this parcel map that you gave me, can I put this on our website? Is this public knowledge? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, because okay. I'm looking yeah. at that right now, and uh, it's quite interesting. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, the thing is, you know, you were asking how I put all these things together. Well, the the uh, power company put these things together. The you know those you know the thin pieces were actually condemned because they were going to build this dam, which mm-hmm. never got built. Isn't it ironic? Okay. <laughs> That was one of my questions. Like, how did this little skinny sliver? I mean, how wide, like from the high water mark up the bank? Like, how much property are we talking about on the edge? We're going the- to. That's going to have to be determined because it's an old, you know, it's an old plot and it's never been surveyed. I mean, these old, you know, it it was weird enough down in the Cheat Canyon, and this one here, I don't think it's ever been surveyed. We think it's about. We think it's going to be about 200 feet from the high water mark. Hmm. And, you know, getting that thing surveyed and uh, that's going to be that's going to be something that we need somebody like the West Virginia Land Trust to work on. Mm -hmm. Because the whole business of, um, of holding land in perpetuity is very different from running a nonprofit. You know, an organization like AW, we get grant money, we get membership money, we run festivals, and we spend the money, and then go do it again. And if we have a bad year, people get people get laid off, and uh, our work becomes less ambitious. What happens with a with a land trust is that they is that they uh, when they get the land, they're also, you know not only checking it to make sure there's no there's no hidden pitfall but they are also creating a uh, an endowment to to keep to continue to maintain the property we need to raise about seventy five thousand dollars and we will raise that money um i'm convinced i'm convinced that there's that support in the paddling community Plus, I've got my eye on a couple of other th- other pieces. I don't know if it's going to work, so I don't want to talk about it. But I think there, I think there is potential for some more purchases, and so we're, uh, you know, we're we're raising money so that the West Virginia Land Trust can not only do all their survey and prep work, but so that they will have the beginnings of an endowment, and. That's that's really the best place for the property. When we were doing Jenkinsburg, I was asking myself, well, who should I put it with? Friends of Cheat? 
Friends of Cheat is a great organization, but they hit two, you know, in the years that I've been with them, they had two pretty serious bumps in the ground, bumps that they hit. Nothing as serious as American Whitewater, which, you know, almost stopped functioning in the late 80s and uh, and had a very serious uh, downturn when the dot-com bubble burst and a lot of their grants got cut back. So the land trust, because of the way it's structured, is a safer place for long-term for, for, for long term protection of the land. And if something happens to them, they have a backup in the, in the National Land Trust Organization, which would take the property and try to place it. My, he says that he, I'm told that they would probably place it with the state. But it, you know, I'm trying to think not about 10 years. I'm trying to think 50 years or more. And so that's the goal is to keep the keep the land with the land trust rather than looking for some public ownership as a as a takeout for that. Uh, you know, if if West Virginia were a state like Maryland, <laughs> the Sheet Canyon and the Big Sandy would already be protected, just like the Upper Yacht is. Right. But you know, West Virginia, they're still trying to figure out subsidies for coal companies and uh, campus carry and. Uh, you know, stop, you know, stop transgender kids from using bathrooms. I, I, I'm on this mailing list for uh, for the legislature and the amount of horse manure that goes on down there. Uh, utterly worthless bullshit. <laughs> when what we really need to do, fix the roads, improve the schools and push Internet as far up the damn hollows as we can. But that's not going to happen. They're still trying to resuscitate coal. The, the state of West Virginia is the only place that thinks, uh, thinks that coal is a future investment. I understand that because I, you know, you go back to the to the fifties, it dominated communities. I don't, you, I don't know if any of you guys remember Ralph Teeter, who had the campground for a while. Mm-hmm. I was talking to him about a story I heard of him going into a collapsing mine to get to get equipment out. And I said, Ralph, that's the craziest story I've ever heard. I know you were in Vietnam, but that sounds worse. And he says, Charlie, I had four brothers. And the only person in my family who did not work in the mines was my mother. And that's what a lot of people, particularly the, you know, the older generation in West Virginia remembers. That's what they want to bring back. And of course, it'll never come back because coal mining is so mechanized now. It'll never have that kind of hiring. But as I said, their focus is elsewhere. You know, I I could go on and on about this. (laughs) Is there any infrastructure or trails? Like, can you, is there a trail out there on River Left? Is there any? Yeah, I had heard that they'd talk about putting a trail there. So you, you could do a shuttle along that trail. Is that true, or is that well? A room? The Allegheny Trail runs down the Cheat Canyon, and then it go. Then it has a section where it goes out of the woods on the roads. They are very interested in relocating the trail through the big San, the uh, lower Big Sandy Gorge, mm-hmm. and in fact, they donated significant money to us as part as part of the purchase effort, mm-hmm. and they are probably scouting it or will be scouting it very soon they you know they're not they're not cutting it they're not cutting anything or opening anything but they're just going down there and trying to figure out what it is but until we get those lower parcels surveyed we really can't have people cutting trails but the west west virginia land trust is very interested in uh in promoting outdoor recreation they do it at all of their all of their uh, sites and that's the reason why we dave and i work with them on jenkinsburg that's pretty cool yeah very cool how long were you working on this charlie this particular project you know was was probably was probably about a year but you know this is something that i've been interested in for a long time at one point after the dot-com bubble burst i heard that allegheny wood might be interested in selling the river right parcel and i got about 
six guys together and we made them an offer and they never responded to it. And I finally called them up and they just sort of hemmed and hawed and said they weren't interested. And I later found out that they thought my money was too green for them, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, they weren't going to support, you know, public access and that sort of thing. I mean, we went, we went, we went around the block with them on, uh, on Jenkinsburg. You know, they closed the Allegheny Trail soon after they got the Cheat Canyon, and we were afraid they were going to close Jenkinsburg down. And Dave Huff bought Jenkinsburg mm -hmm. as part of as part of buying his rafting company, and that's why we were able to get Jenkinsburg. Because talking to if it does if it doesn't involve cutting trees, and you don't have something they want, they're not interested in talking to you. In regards to Jenkinsburg, I mean, whoever owns that property inherited probably somewhere between five and seven million beer cans a year. What who <laughs> takes care of all of that and keeps the keeps have changed a great deal? Yeah, uh, you know, we uh, the first thing is we entered into a twenty year lease for paddlers in mm -hmm. exchange for fixing the place up. Friends mm -hmm. Chief raised about thirty thousand dollars, got matching money from the state, and fix the upper parking lot. You remember those mud holes. I mean, sure. shit, there was one that would swallow a pickup truck hole oh, no. and, and created the parking lot. I don't, have you, you've been there since the parking lot was built, right? It's been a couple of years, but yeah, yeah. That was 06. And, oh, yeah. uh, and we, you know, we've been working, you know, and I knew with that parking lot that, Fixing it up was going to be the first step because there were some locals who really liked it the way it was. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, some people came in and they burned the signs and they tore the gate out. We replaced the gate. They rolled rocks to get their machines through. We put the damn rocks back. If they crashed through the woods, we put up barbed wire. Um, and this went on for, you know, like almost 20 years. And it was, it was, it was me and it was me and Dave and whoever else we could get to help us. And I just have a we, visual of you guys down there throwing rocks at people in their four wheelers. But anyway, go no, we don't throw rocks. We don't. <laughs> <I'm> just <kidding. laughs> because confronting them is a dead end. I mean, I tried that. It's a dead end. The one, the one time, the one time I had a good experience was a couple of guys were down there and they were just obviously trying to figure out where to go, how to get through. And I walked over and said, guys, don't do that. Because if you do, I have to call the sheriff. And then, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and of course, the joke is I could call the sheriff and the sheriff would <laughs> right. probably not come down. I mean, you know, it takes them over an hour to get down there. And, yeah. you know, yeah. it's it's one of the, it's one of the reasons why there's been such problems. We were really fortunate. There was a fellow named Matt Schaefer, who was a DNR officer, and he was he had been assigned to do something in Morgantown, some kind of an office job that he hated. And so he went and enforced laws for trespass and litter on his spare time. I asked him what I should do because I knew he was a DNR officer. And I said, should we hire some off-duty cops? And he says, Oh no, don't tell anybody. This is going to be my own private honey hole. <laughs> He'd go down there and he would, he would write like a couple dozen citations. One day he wrote, uh, he wrote two dozen citations that confiscated eight ATVs. <laughs> and of course, you know, to get those machines back, you got to pay like hundreds of dollars. Cash and, and checks, man. And so with this going on, I think the the really rowdy crowd figured that there was probably a better place for them to do whatever it is they do. I mean, it was nuts. I mean, there was drug dealing going on. Yeah. Matt said that he had a lot of guys had you know had drugs, and he said, "I'm not a drug officer, so I just made them pour it out on the ground." And you know, it amazes me because this is a guy of average size, and you know, he had his uniform and he had his firearm, but. You know, he's going down and there's these big crowds and and uh if you met him, you'd know why people didn't mess with him. There's something about him. 
Oh, so Charlie, you've seen a longer timeline with paddling than we have. You know, you saw where it was way early on to where it is now. Where do you see the whole whitewater thing going? What are going to be the biggest opportunities and challenges in your eyes? I I wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, there have been so you know, people are running things that I never thought people would run, and and uh, you know the gear is really good, and you know it's you know you know each each generation just takes things it takes things forward in their own way, and I I've, I've enjoyed watching it. You know, I can remember, you know, when I was when I was in my twenties, some some old time paddler stopped me and yelled at me because we were boat scouting. We weren't getting out and scouting a rapid. Mm -hmm. And you know, things things continue to evolve, and I th and I think think it's really neat. I think as long as the as long as the economy stays good, people are going to go boating. There's all these people who came in. Over the uh, over COVID, I mean, a lot of them will just won't stick with it, but some of them will. Right, the people that donated the money to your to this effort here on the on the Big Sandy, do they need dry suits? Do you think? Do you think we could <laughs> send them an email? <laughs> Maybe some new spray skirts. <laughs> well, if you if you guys if you guys were interested in doing something like that, I'd be happy to, uh, no, to give kidding. you. <laughs> they don't want to find me. <laughs> they need to send drug suit. They can find me. Um, yeah. I I can't let you go unless unless you answer a question that I'm sure you've answered a thousand times before, but I have to ask it. Charlie's choice on the upper yacht. That's you, right? You're the Charlie. That's me. And what and, and what year? How did this name come to pass? And who who named it that? Um, this would have been. The uh, spring of 1972, and I I paddled a lot with Dave Demery, mm -hmm. and I met Dave, and I was trying to talk him into the North Branch of the Potomac, but he was all fired up for the Upper Yacht, and I hadn't run the Upper Yacht, but I figured, you know, I'd run the I'd run the Lower Blackwater, and uh, I'd run the North Branch of the Potomac, you know, I was ready, I was ready. Well, we got up there, and it's three feet. It was me, Dave, and his brother Danny. Right. And and uh, as we went down the river, I was sort of getting nervous because you know three feet. There's a lot of water in that river. Right. And the fiberglass boats, 1972, right? Yeah. But I had uh, I had a really horrible run in bastard that had a couple of rolls, and then at Charlie's, you know, got got messed up and. You know, got stuck on a rock and had to work my way off with my hands and almost dropped my paddle. Got into an it got into an eddy, and I was shaking. And my spray skirt had popped, and I was shaking so hard I couldn't put the skirt back on. So I knew it was time for me to get off the river. So I, I told Dave that I needed to get out, and he said, "Yeah, we'll get out." And I said, "And I said, well, Dave, I don't want to ruin your day. I can find my way back." And he said. My little brother's scared too. <laughs> this isn't showing it. And so it's like that. And it actually turns out to be one of the easier places to get out of the upper yacht and walked our way back to saying run. And Danny, his younger brother, is a writer. And he wrote a lot about the upper yacht, including the description that got into uh, Wild Water West Virginia. And he named most of the rapids, cheeseburger, meat cleaver. I mean, you know, meat cleaver used to be known as Bickham's tree rapid <laughs> because Bill Bickham apparently lost uh, lost an aluminum boat there, and uh, you know, the only the only the only one of the old names that survives is Heinzerling, but Danny wrote articles that named all of these drops. And for year, for a couple of years, Danny and Dave were the only people who were running it regularly. So those they were the ones who people went down with. And finally, there were a lot of guys who, a lot of, a lot of guys who knew it, who were guiding on the lower yacht. 
And, you know, it's sort of gradually expanded. And, of course, getting weekend water, I mean, that was that was amazing. That was Pope Barrow and Steve Taylor and Mac Thornton working, working on that. That was an AW project way back. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I grew up in with Tom McEwen, so I know the story about Tommy's Hole and uh, Wright's Hole. And Heinzerling. You know, Tommy's Hole has been, I asked Tommy how it got named, and yeah. he said he broached in it. Yeah. And he was upside down in it, and a couple of people ran over him. Right. <laughs> exactly. Huh. What year was, just out of curiosity, do you know what year was the Upper Yacht first run? Like, what year did they first? It was... You know, that would have been, that would have been, that would have been Bickham Kurtz and Tom Smythe. I think that was like 64. 64. Wow. wow. And they were, it might, it's either 64 or 68. It would have to be in 64. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, you know, I talked to Bill because we did a 50th anniversary thing for Bill years ago. The, the guy who had the Irish bar. Yeah. Got, got us all fired up to do it. And of course, Bickham taught John Sweet. Yeah, and Ben Sweet taught Tom Irwin, and Tom Irwin taught me. <laughs> so you know, there's a direct, there's a direct line there. Yeah, and and uh, you know, he, uh, I talked to him about the run, and he said, "Yeah, we ran it two or three more times, but it was just exhausting." But of course, right. they're running like thirteen foot Grumman's down the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it, you know they tried it with it with the first run was without the release and they did it with a release and they had an awful day so they put spray they got spray covers for their boats but they were really they were really pushing it out there no thigh straps yeah yeah that's crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, Charlie congratulations on all this. I mean, yeah. it's it's a pretty big deal. I mean, do you feel like it's a big deal? Because when I read the article and saw the headline, I was like, that is a big deal. We were, we were very excited. And I think it shows the potential that's in the boating community because it's a great community. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was all gifts from from people, from people, people who paddled. I don't know if I could have raised as much money as he wanted, as the guy wanted for the whole thing. I mean, that's... You know that's probably like four or five times as much mm -hmm. as what I raised, but there is potential there, and and of course, friends of Cheat has has bought property. They bought they bought the uh, parking lot at, at Rockville, and they've been, they they've got the festival site. So, you know, you don't wait for the damn government to do things. You just <laughs> go out and get it done done yourself. You know, you know. Certainly, there were people in AW who were really good at harassing the government, but I'm not very good at that. You know, it's like I'm interested in figuring out how to get it done. Unfortunately, this worked, and I'm very grateful. I'm particularly grateful to Dave Huff, who developed the relationship with the uh, with 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 the waterfront folks, and who was just instrumental in so many different ways. Well, I think we'll probably let you go here. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I got to just say big thank you from everybody in the paddling scene. And also just like, I mean, I said it at the top of our interview, but I've never known Whitewater without your accident reports. So, you know, you're you, definitely... you don't find them too depressing. They're not every, they're not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah, but they're so important. Yeah, they're, they're, I think they're so important. because we want people to talk about this stuff. For sure, we don't want people just to be quiet and just to you know. We want them to talk about it because when people talk about it, they'll figure out the best way to manage the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it'll get lost if you don't write it down. Unfortunately, well, <laughs> it, it's it's uh, helpful, I think, to have a. To, to have some people who are collecting it. It was certainly helpful for me as a young camp counselor to read the accident reports in, uh, in Appalachia Journal. 
Well, where can our listeners learn more about what you're up to and all of that business? Well, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's anything that I haven't told you about. I have a website, charliewalbridge.com. And of course, the, uh, the business of the, you know, the acquisition of the big Sandy property is, uh, is, on, is on the American Whitewater website. What about social media? Do you have any of that? I I have my own page, and I also have a page called AW Accident Database. And what I wanted to do there is to get some of the accident reports off of my own page because it was just sort of taking it over. I'm going to put some accident reports there, but gosh, during the... Gosh, there was one one part of this season, late June, early July. It was incredibly busy, mm. and and uh, it's also to give people who maybe don't want to become my my Facebook friend to have a place to have a place that they can see the accident reports. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. But <laughs> Facebook has been a huge help to me. Because I get most of my accident reports on Facebook Messenger, and I do most of my fundraising not for this so much, but for, but for, but for the but for Jenkinsburg and for the road in by by begging on by begging on Facebook. We need to get you and a TikTok not, page. What's that? We need to get you a TikTok page. Do you know any dance moves or anything? We can kind of spice it up a little bit, you know. I'm not a very spicy guy, you know. <laughs> well, what's your TikTok handle? <laughs> I don't have one yet. I don't have one either. Uh, no. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for taking the time Thanks, for coming on here and talking to us. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks so much. Thanks, Charlie. It's good to see you. Appreciate Bye. it. <clears throat> well, man. I mean, Charlie. Man, we go on and on. Charlie would be a great like after the river campfire hangout session for like six hours of yeah mm, <clears throat> beers and stories. Should we do some viewer yeah. mail? Is that should we do that real quick and then move on with our with our lives? <clears throat> I wanted to ask Charlie what he thought about uh, lithium ion technology, mm. but I. Don't think he thought I would have been serious about it. Not from the hammer factor bingo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What are the entries? What are the entries of the hammer factor bingo? Real quick. <laughs> Hang on. Let me bring them up because I've got it right here on my I yeah. saved these because that was pretty priceless. All right. These are uh, these are you can play at home. Yeah. Make a bingo card. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have to do this. I'll I'll put these in the whitewater journals when I send those out. <laughs> you can have your own hammer factor bingo. <clears throat> so you can fill it out. First guy who fills this whole thing out. What do we got on here? We got lithium ion batteries. Weld apologizes. <laughs> Lewis uses a word from the SAT in the same sentence as the word sick. <laughs> <laughs> One wheel. <laughs> Lewis uses a word I have only read in print before. <laughs> paddle length and offset. I forgot to ask Charlie about his paddle length and offset. He's a sea water. Doesn't matter. Length and length and inches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all about the T grip. Right. Um, like I said, White Warner Journal plug, hammerheads, and Valley Mill. Charlie ever got the <laughs> old <Bell>? group? <laughs> old group. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's jump into some uh, listener mail and get into rants and raves. We have kept our listeners long enough here. Um. Ooh, where are we at? I'm all discombobulated. I'm going to tighten it up. I promise. Um. Okay. This comes uh comes at us from who does this come at us from? Um. Uh, Matthias Fosted. Ah, he's a he's a uh, he's a diehard listener. Matthias says, "Can one of you please rant about the back deck rollover wave craze we are seeing in kayak and media these days?" <laughs> it's as bad as a few years back when every video had to include 45 to 60 seconds of dizzying turn squirting rant matthias 
<laughs> Lewis, I, I feel like this was right up your alley, Lewis. You may Go have ahead. to incorporate that because you have definitely ranted about the 45 to 60 second stern squirts. I have. Do you remember that? So I don't know. I guess I feel like a good kick flip is uh still impressive. Oh. We may have to have a head to head here debate between you and Matias. <laughs> um, this comes at us from Glenn Kayama. He's looking for some Phoenix kayak. <laughs> you should have Charlie. Charlie would have been the perfect person to answer this one. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I lost it with Lewis's comment. This is our new demographic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't know anything about Glenn. So anyway, I'm looking for lightweight river kayak and located a Phoenix kayak, which I thought it might be a slipper. Right. How do I tell the difference? Would this boat be appropriate for someone 73 years old, five foot five and weighs 207 pounds? It looks like it might have been stored outside. Will it be too brittle? I'm transitioning out of whitewater and we'll be paddling mostly flash moving flat water and perhaps some low end class too. I would use the crossfire I own, but at my weight, the boat does not paddle well. I get left behind in the Remix 69. I have also seen a Hydra Dragonfly, but don't know anything about them. I have also <laughs> thought about a full-size pirouette, Animus, or possibly an Outburst. Do you have any suggestions? Thanks for your time. Is this John might be like this. Start from the 90s? <laughs> <Or is> this... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, luckily, Weld is probably like the foremost surviving Phoenix kayaks expert, so... Well, the Phoenix boat would be perfect when you're ready to do the upstream race and on entrance rapid on the Ock. That's that's your boat of choice there. Uh, I mean, if we're going to seriously answer this question, no, you do not want to buy the Phoenix. It, 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 yes, it's too brittle. It's not comfortable. It's going to be tippy. It's not, nothing you want nothing to do with that, right? And you're not going to be able to find a skirt for it, are you? I mean, how yeah, about like no. a how about like a nice modern longboat, like like exactly. a Dagger Vanguard or a exactly. Green Boat yeah. or something like that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what you want. Yeah. I'll second that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> let's see, we've got the Stinger, we've got the 12R, and we've got the Dagger Vanguard as All long these boats, boats that will float. Are, they're old boats with small cockpits. Skirts aren't going to fit on them. They're going to be really uncomfortable. You're going to have a hard time getting out of these things. A boat made in the past five to ten years, a long plastic boat, is going to be a thousand times easier to paddle and more comfortable and you'll be able to find a skirt that fits it without going to a yard sale somewhere. Yeah, the only downside is it's going to weigh twice as much. That's it's true. Gonna, it's going. It's not going to be light. But Glenn, I'm going to recommend you get a Stinger XP with a drop down skeg, and you'll never look back. Nice. Um. Okay. Will snow? Let's see where are we at? Subject: Snowcoby Falls. Um. Good to hear you guys are back. So he was listening to our safety report. And I have to jump in here real quick. I've got our iTunes feed fixed. If it wasn't coming through on your um, iTunes feed, it should now, um, the hammer factor. But we had, we talked about the harrowing rescue of the green, which still blows my mind to this day. You should go back and listen to that episode. If you haven't had a chance yet, it's definitely worth it. Um, anyway, he had a big beat down, um, He's in a piranha boat. I don't know if I got the actual design on here, but anyway, his boat paddled over Snoqualmie Falls. Three Forks was 25,000 CFS. It looks like the boat floated for, I don't know how many miles. How many miles is that? It got for the two, it floated two hours downriver. He finally recovered the boat, had a small little ding in it. He's given props to Piranha Kayaks for making badass strong boats. I mean, do you think that's an indication that somebody should go around Snoqualmie Falls now? I mean, it, it's got to be. How tall is that? 248 feet, he said yeah. in the email. 268 right here. Lessons I learned, even Class 3, 4 rivers should be taken seriously, especially when they are flooding and Piranha makes burly fucking boats. Um, thanks for Speaking that email, class, Will. Whitewater, our, our our friend and Hammer Factor guest, Brian Miller, had a little incident on Class 4 Whitewater. Yeah, on Big Creek, you know. Well, we may need to bring him on to discuss that. If you haven't checked it out, he's got a pretty uh, good account of getting pinned upside down on a rock. And I mean, Brian's a world champion kayaker, so. You right, know, that's the takeaway. I mean, it was 
Last four, he got stuck underwater. He really sounded like he was very close to drowning and he managed to squeak his way out of that thing. That's kind of the beginning and the end of the story, but it was on a class four rapid, right? Yep. yep. So. yep. But it's barely class four. You know, it's a continuous. Have you ever been Big Creek? Either of you guys? I think I have. Yep. Um. Yep. Now this email from Travis, do you guys understand this email? Which one is it? Um, great hearing your voices again. Um, I thought of the ABRG when I watched these videos. Though it has been long enough, I had to look up his name. I uh, thought this was really interesting. Interesting. If they speak English, I would love to get them on the show. They have a few videos I'm blown away. It's so cool. I'll put a link to this in the show notes. Watching the Green Race and all these Groms, boat building a home. AW has got a new logo director. Maybe we are in for a comeback um youtube and anyway he's has a loot uh youtube link here to the kayak brothers oh and yeah i saw this rode and molded a kayak in their in like their garage yeah so they've got build their own boats and they've got some like trip reports and they definitely have a style so. yeah yeah the youtube algorithm really has my number because it gave me that video the other day and i was like it's pretty wild. I mean, it looked like those guys must have spent just an absolutely unholy amount of time doing this. And it looked like they created a roto molder in their garage. Yeah. 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 I mean, nuts. In a fiberglass mold. I mean, it's definitely the saddest part was the design looks it's not like good. No, paddling it, it looked very <laughs> <laughs> like, oh man, you guys did all this work and your boat design's terrible. <laughs> Lewis. I don't know. I shouldn't say terrible. <laughs> I have no that, idea. That is, it looked uh, like an amazing project. Yeah, the boat looked weird when they were paddling it. I could say that. Yeah. I think the Kayak Brothers would be good. I haven't heard. Do they speak English or is it all? I didn't watch it yet. Nothing um, I saw was in English. And I think that's all. We did get one other listener mail, but I don't think we can discuss that one. Um, we may have to get the uh, ABRG to do some deep dive investigative journalism mm. here in the near future. Let's see mm. what we can come up, come up with. Did you guys see this, uh, this plat that Charlie sent over of the uh, section of river they bought there? Did not. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. All right, guys. Well, we've been here long enough. Um, I don't even know how much time we've been on the show. I mean, we've got to be approaching two hours. And now it's time for everybody's favorite part of the Hammer Factor, your rants and raves, where your hosts go on a little bit of a rant or a little bit of a rave. And we need to put on the bingo list, Lewis doesn't have his rant ready because mm. he's never got it ready. No. Lewis, I think we off. need a new, we need like a new closing segment. Like I need a new prompt, like rant or rave. I don't know. Okay. You want to do something different? I'm too neutral. I don't know. We need, like, I don't know. Maybe you guys go and I'll, I'll come up with something. We need, like, the vanilla closing. We should, no, we not just... the vanilla closing. <laughs> just, like, a new a new gimmick. Okay. All right. Well, or you could prepare for the rants and rants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it's be. You need something that you don't need to prepare for. Do you have something, John? Well... You know, if you were to work with me, you'd hear rants and raves all day. That's yeah, I do too, but somehow know. my mind goes blank as soon as we're on here. No, but so few of them. I feel like I want either it's a lot of inside baseball or it's stuff that's better or not. It's not going to help me professionally by. <laughs> it's always the way, isn't it? Taking a side on some of these issues. Maybe we should just do a rave. I try to rave because I want to be a more positive person than I am, but <laughs> you know, here we are. <laughs> uh, well, you can be off topic. I very seldom have a rant or a rave that has to do with paddling. So, yeah, your dog poop bag was kind of the that's still the going on too. I, it's actually escalating. Like, I mean, just think about like just having a Snickers bar and just throwing the wrapper on the ground and be like, I'll ah, pick it up on my way back. Dude, it's people doing, yeah, I don't know. It's, it doesn't it's bother like, me that much. I mean, it sucks when people forget about it, but 
next time I'm with you, I'm just going to like throw some trash out and be like, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just get it on the way back. I mean, that's what it looks like to me. I don't know. But like the dog poop bag doesn't blow away, you know, it's like weighted. But it just gets left out there with poop in it. Like, I mean, ideally it's for like 20 minutes, right? Wow. That's the theory. Anyway. Um, what do I, I had a rant about the I had a rave or a rant. We may have to scrap it. I had a rant in a client meeting today that I thought was kind of funny. So deep, can I do deep concerns? <laughs> I have some deep concerns about some things. Maybe that should be. Maybe. <laughs> what are you I'll deeply put, concerned about, John? I'll put some, a little jingle <sighs> together. And now for deep concerns <laughs> with John Will. Well, next show, I want to, I want to uh, discuss a consumer, a consumer, what our consumers and kayakers need to know about fluorocarbons in their garments. That sounds PFC, good. P -P because, yeah, because, uh, because I, I think some education will go a long way in helping them make, make some good decisions here. I like um, it. Deep concerns, uh, you know, this paddle sports trade coalitions chugging along. You know, I, I kind of kvetched about it last episode. And once again, this is this is inside baseball. The only people who are going to care about this are people who work in the industry. So uh, it's going to be boring. That's like like 60% of our audience. Yeah, I don't know. I have deep concerns about this whole this whole concept, to be honest. They're not inviting me or asking me to join, so... <laughs> there. What happened to the is, is the paddle show straight paddle sports trade show coming back? Well, that's it sounds like thing. OR is circling. Yeah, the brain. that's the thing is you know we had a paddle sports trade. We left outdoor retailer to, to the to this own this new paddle sports show. This is about five six years ago. It was in Oklahoma, and paddle sports trade shows are not easy to organize. Right, they cost a lot of money. There's a lot of drama, a lot of headaches, a lot of organization. It's it's a whole thing, right? And unless you have a tremendous amount of resources and this is your job and you have a huge group of people to bring together these to this thing to fund this and you ha you have the you know the whole momentum to make this happen it, there it is a dead end for the most part i think at least that's been my observation and it's a lot like running a race right a, a kayak race these things have to be run fiscally responsibly above first and foremost for them to succeed right grace oh yeah it has to it has yeah. to work out on paper so they started this paddle sports show. They did it for two or three years. And then the people organized it just dropped it. And for whatever reason, and they started another trade show doing something else. And they kind of left us high and dry. Uh, my trade show booth, by the way, is still in Oklahoma, you know, because I have no place to put it. Anyway, they're talking about doing another paddle sports trade show. And it looks like they're bringing the same group of people who did this first paddle sports show to organize this one again. And I have deep concerns about that. I, I don't think that seems like a smart idea to me. Those are people in the industry who follow along with us know what I'm talking about. What's their mission? The Palace Sports Organization? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It looks like uh, they have like a web page. It looks like, you know, the usual corporate rhetoric, rhetoric they're trying to empower Palace Sports. Or... I mean, Palace Sports so, sales are kind of more than they've ever been. And they got there without having any kind of industry show. So... I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I think conceptually, I think a trade show makes a lot of sense. I, I do. I think it's economically, it makes a lot of sense. Environmentally, it makes a lot of sense. If we could all go to one place and plan together as a as a as an industry, right, and not send sales reps all across the country in sprinter vans to clinic stores mm -hmm. individually, if we could all do it one place. It, it it's better for the industry, and we get on one buying cycle. Um, so you know. Um, like I get that, uh, uh, you know, I'm worried that leaving that behind is one step closer to retailers becoming irrelevant and I don't want that to happen. I think that'd be a terrible turn of events, you know, and, and, you know, we need to keep retailers engaged and participating. And I don't think they want, I don't think they want to go to five or six trade shows. I think they would rather go to one. <clears throat> I think their show should be, have a wide tent. I think you should bring in the entire 
you know, outdoor industry or as mm. much as it makes sense to us, you know. That's what I'd I love to see, you know, I just think that but people, show... people now go out the retailer now and they say it's dead. So maybe, maybe that ship has sailed, yeah. you know, maybe that's those days are gone. So yeah. I understand that too. Hmm. I came up with a rave. Oh, good. Oh, well, let's hear it. Like filibustering about trade shows again. That's not, that's <laughs> how long it took. So it's perfect. Um, I'm going to rave about, man, there's like, there's a crew of young guys in the gorge now who are super motivated boss five paddlers and also like super checked out chainsaw operators and like the wood removal operation we've had going in the gorge the last couple of years on the little way has been just like all time awesome. Like, <laughs> I mean, like I think about like, you know, 10 years ago and like, like watching Lane standing out on like an icy log in the middle of Island with a bow saw, trying to like cut some piece of wood out there. And like the pieces of wood that would just like end up in the river. And we're just like, well, like maybe we can find somebody who's good with a chainsaw and we can try it in like September when the river's like maximally low. And like yesterday, like Todd Wells and Owen Doyle and Jessica Lara just like ripped out the most fucked up, like, 20 inch diameter piece of wood in the middle of getting busy at like four two at like four in the <laughs> afternoon <laughs> and it was like i'm like it is so sweet having those guys and like the work that like galen was doing on that piece of wood that we had in in uh s turn for a while like just like having all these guys out here like doing yeah getting wood out of the river is like it's so sweet i will i like to say as, as a uh as a closing statement, if someone from the Palace Wars Trade Organization wants to come on and shut me down and show me how I'm wrong every which way to Sunday, please, by all means, I want to hear it. I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Right now, I'm not really part of it, so I'm, I'm maybe I'm talking out of school. Yeah, I just want to ask him, why are you still grinding away at this? What do you want to see happen? Right. What's you the know? Yeah. That's it. You know, I'm just well, like, just put me in charge. I'll, I'll get this. I'll get this business figured out. <laughs> I don't need an organization to do it. I need like a fucking like two hours just give your money to outdoor alliance someday w or to go a lot further hey by the way you're welcome uh geltman oh yeah IR, thank you yeah I, yeah i are pointed up for our tickets right. to your gala or whatever it is oh are you guys coming <laughs> i don't know <laughs> like a gala in dc I'm, i presume i have to wear like a, a tuxedo or something we'll be star yeah. studded event. Yeah, Wait, what so. is this lewis are you planning this what's going on no i'm dude i'm checked out on everything it's <laughs> you know what I'm we, about? yeah we have a it's our it's t outdoor alliance's 10 year anniversary this year and we're having some sort of event in dc in september with that john sounds like knows more about than i do there is some adam, sort of event adam, in adam, DC adam, in september a, the donation because he knew we're a soft touch and we ponied up <laughs> what is this like a thousand we're bucks to get dinner we're proud, to, like... we're proud to work with you guys what's that is this like a thousand bucks and you get dinner or like how's it work? Okay. I don't, I don't know. Actually. I don't think we. I don't think we were rolling at that level yet. I think it's but... like a. It was. It was like that. Yeah. I think. That's I think it's I think... like a thousand. It's like a thousand bucks, and you're like the title sponsor. No, 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 <laughs> no. Title sponsor was way more than that. But we did give you a thousand yeah. bucks, and uh, I think it's like cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks that's for listening right. to episode ninety <laughs> of the Hammer Factor. Um, big thanks to Charlie for coming on. Man. How many years has he been doing that? 50 years? Forever. 60 Forever. years, maybe? He was talking about Whitewater in the 60s. So 70s, yeah. 70s. 50 years, probably close to 50 years. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, thanks for coming on. We got to figure out a way to do these earlier on East Coast time, Lewis. Yeah, we got we can't do it on Mondays. Mondays Fox. We gotta do it like Fridays. Fridays. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Send us over some more listener mail. Um, we'll get our bingo cards out in the Whitewater Journal. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening. Peace.